Hi class, it's Professor Adamson here. We gotta make this video fast. I'm here at work and I'm gonna go through real quickly what's called a complete audiological evaluation. Basically, a test that we would do for every single patient that we see for the first time, sort of like a baseline. The very first thing that we would do is case history where I take the time to go back and look into the patient's chart, uh, ask the patient questions, read over the information that the patient filled out ahead of time. It's really in your best interest. And I, I, I'm going to get in my soapbox here on it for a second. And this is for speech language pathologists too. Do your homework. Please, please, please get information ahead of time. Know at least a little bit why the patient is there to see you. I tell you why. It makes a world of difference in terms of um, building that bridge between you and the patient. I uh, This is going to sound like I'm tooting my own horn, but I always have very, very good relationships with my patients almost immediately. And a lot of that is due to, and this is intentional, I take the time to know a little bit about why the patient is there before I go to see them. How many times have you gone to your doctor's office um, or a specialist's office and you've filled out the paperwork, you've gone over all the stuff online, you've done all the stuff that you asked, that they asked you to do, and then the person whooshes into the room and says, so why are you here? And you're like, really? Did, I, uh, did you not read any of the stuff? You didn't take the time to care enough about me to read the stuff that you made me fill out and now you're just gonna kind of whoosh in like you're some magic, like you're some magician or something. It will make a difference if if you take the time to know why your patients are there. Just when I say, like, I understand you've been having some pain in your left ear, you see this almost look of relief on the patient's face. Like, yes, thank you for not making me explain it all over again. Okay, so after we do that, we do what's called otoscopy, where we take an otoscope. And otoscope, you guys are familiar with. Pretty much any doctor you go to is going to do otoscopy. Even uh, just regular general practitioner. Reason being is it kind of gives us a glimpse into the overall health of the body if we can take a look inside the ear. Okay, now with otoscopy, I can't do it really on myself. But with otoscopy on adult, we pull the uh, pinna of the ear back and up and shine the light in. On a child or a, a toddler or a baby, we pull it up and down a little bit. Both of those... Uh, actions are to essentially straighten out the ear canal. The ear canal kind of is a, a very gradual S-shaped to help protect the eardrum and the more delicate structures that, are, that lie beyond. So by doing otoscopy and pulling up and back, we're straightening it out so we can get a direct shot to the eardrum. Um, we're looking basically for outer and middle ear pathology at that point, things like a um, infections, um, polyps, all that sort of thing. Okay, so after we do otoscopy, the next thing that we do is, I could grab my pen, what's called pure tone audiometry. What we do is take a set of headphones here like this, or we can even use what are called insert earphones, which are like these. These clip on and kind of go into the ear like this with a little foam piece on there. I really should have gloves on touching all this stuff. Don't worry, I will just I will I will wipe everything down with a purple rag after this is done. But those are what are called transducers. We talked about auditory transduction in yesterday's video. Basically, the sound comes out left, blue for left, red for right, out of these transducers, whether you use the inserts or the supraoral over the ear headphones. We're gonna wanna test one ear at a time, of course. Patients always find that very confusing. Like, oh, you're gonna, but that ear's normal. Why are you testing that ear? It's like, well, we always test both ears. So I'm here at the audiometer. I'm gonna flip this around. That's where we just were, where the patient sits. Generally, I'll have the patient maybe sit to the side just so that they're not looking right at you. But the next thing I do is pure tone audiometry. This is the audiometer, and it has a whole bunch of buttons, and I'm not gonna go through all of it, but the essence of audiology is me needing to find thresholds of hearing for the right ear and the left ear at six different tested frequencies for air conduction, 
which is sound that goes through the entire peripheral auditory system, outer, middle, inner, and then eventually going to the central. And then bone conduction, which are sounds that just go from inner to central. Air uses either headphones or the inserts like we talked about. Bone just uses the bone oscillator, which I'll show you that later. But I don't really have time to go through it in much detail, but suffice it to say, I am going in the right ear at each of these frequencies. Let's just do this. At 1000 Hertz, I'm gonna turn this up to 60 decibels, 1000 Hertz, headphone, to see if the patient could hear that. If the patient reports hearing it at 60 decibels, I'm gonna turn the intensity down to 50 decibels and present the tone. If the patient hears it there, go down to 40, et cetera, et cetera. Keep going down in dB level until the patient doesn't hear it. Let's pretend he or she didn't hear it. So at that point, I'm gonna go up to 15 decibels, present, and if the patient hears it, I'm gonna go down 10 dB from there. We keep going up five and down 10 dB until we've got two or three positive responses at the lowest dB level for the patient's responses in general. And let's say that number for this patient was 15 decibels. I would put a circle at 15 decibels for the right ear. Now that's just for 1000 Hertz. From there, we have to go to 2000 Hertz. Repeat that whole process again. And you can start wherever you want. If you perceive the person has hearing loss, you're gonna to wanna to start at a louder dB level. Now I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I do want you guys to hear this, that at 1000 Hertz, that's the pure tone. Remember, a pure tone is a sound that occurs at one frequency and one frequency only. Okay. When we get to 2000 Hertz, what do you notice? That is exactly an octave above. Those of you who are musicians or have any musical training, you know that an octave is do, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. It's eight notes up on the piano, for example. When I go to 4,000 hertz, that's a doubling of frequency, giving you once again another octave. So every time we double the frequency, we are going up the octave. Now, 8,000 is all the more we go to. But let's say for this patient, we got 20 decibel threshold at 2,000. And then let's say we started to drop down. At 40,000 hertz, I had to make the sound be 60 decibels before the patient heard it in the first place. Because there's a big difference there, I'm going to go back and test 3,000 just to kind of show the progression there. Let's say then at 8,000, we get to 70 decibels. I'm going to go back and do 250 and 5. These low frequencies are hard to hear, so we never start with them. But let's say I get that. And then I switch the transducer to the left ear, left, and I go back through that whole process again. Okay, 1,000 hertz. Get the threshold there, 2,000, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say for, I'm just making this up, but let's say for this one, we get more or less a straight line across, okay, for each of those thresholds. For the left ear, we do X's. That's just to differentiate the right from the left ear. Most audiograms, you're gonna see the X's and O's on top of each other. I really like at Montefiore, we don't do that. We separate it out so that you can see distinctly right versus left hearing configuration. Now, any thresholds that are above 25 decibels are considered normal hearing thresholds. So if the X's and O's are above 25 decibels, the person has normal hearing. So what would we say about this patient? He or she has normal hearing in the left ear, in the right ear, within normal limits through 2000 Hertz, sloping to a moderately severe hearing loss. Now we do not yet know if this hearing loss is conductive, if it's sensory neural, or if it's mixed, okay? In 
order to determine that, we have to go back over to the other side, take the headphones or the inserts off the patient and put the bone oscillator on, okay? The bone oscillator is a really uncomfortable thing that sits behind the person's ear, like a headband, right here on the mastoid part of the temporal bone. To be honest, it can go anywhere on your skull, but we always put it there. It can really go on either side because believe it or not, what the bone oscillator is doing is bypassing the outer and middle ear, vibrating your entire skull at the frequencies that we're testing it at, giving you the perception of sound, even though the sound is really just skull vibrations, setting the fluids of the cochlea into vibration, which then sets the membranes and the hair cells. In other words, you could think of bone conduction. When we talked yesterday in that video about acoustic to mechanical to hydraulic to electric, bone conduction bypasses acoustic and mechanical. Bone conduction is the device hydraulic to electric, okay? What does that tell us? Bone conduction, I'm gonna flip this back around. I'm gonna flip this to bone. And we're gonna do a bone testing, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. But I'm gonna go back, oops, over to here. Bone conduction thresholds are these little carrots. I get bone conduction thresholds that more or less match up with air conduction in the left ear. So that makes sense because bone and air should be the same when hearing is normal. But when I put masking into the left ear to eliminate the contribution of the left ear, I get bone conduction thresholds in the right ear within normal limits at 1,000 or 4,000 hertz. We don't test bone at 8,000, but nevertheless, do you see how there is a gap at 4,000 hertz between air and bone? Air conduction in the right ear, 60 decibels, but when I eliminate the contribution of the outer and middle ear and test the cochlea directly in the right ear, I'm getting normal hearing. This is what's called an air bone gap. Bone is normal, air is not. In other words, the pathology has to lie somewhere along the outer or middle ear. When we test the organ of hearing directly, it's normal at this frequency. But when we put sound through the entire peripheral auditory system, the person has hearing loss. This person has a diagnosis of left ear hearing within normal limits, right ear hearing within normal limits through 2000 hertz, sloping to a moderately severe conductive hearing loss. If this person had a sensory neural hearing loss, this masked bone line would be down here and match the air. In other words, when I put the sound through the entire system versus when I put the sound through just the uh, the uh, cochlea, I get the same result. So it's it would be sensory neural, okay? If the bone line was somewhere between normal and matching the air conduction, that would be a mixed hearing loss, meaning that some of it is due to air conduction and some of it is some of it is due to conductive hearing loss and some of it is due to sensory neural. Okay, so the next thing we do is speech. I turn this to microphone. I put on my little headset here. I'm not gonna do it right now, but I'm gonna put this on to microphone left. I gotta put this on to phone. I am going to talk to the patient at an audible level and turn this on. And I'm going to introduce a list of 10 words to the patient common English words. If the person doesn't speak English, you can maybe find some words that are so common that they might even know them. But for the purposes of this test, what we're going to do is 10 English words. I use the same 10 with every single patient. Say the word playground, say the word daybreak, 
say the word northwest. Sorry about that. Say the word mushroom. Say the word doormat. Say the word eardrum. I changed this one to ice cream instead of iceberg. Iceberg is not so well known. Say the word padlock. Say the word sunset. And then I skip down to cowboy. I don't know what the heck a duck pond is. I mean, I know what it is, but it's not a very common word. So I use those 10. I tell them to the patient ahead of time. I have them repeat them back. And then I start dropping the volume here by 10 decibels and give them another word on the list. Drop it by 10 decibels. Give them another word on the list. Say the word ice cream, ice cream. Say the word playground, playground. Say the word doormat, doormat. It will get to the point where I say, say the word cowboy, and the person will say, huh? And I will, at that point, go up five decibels. We use that same sort of staircase method of down 10 dB, up 5 dB, um, until we get the threshold for speech. So we have now gotten thresholds for pure tones in the right ear, thresholds for pure tones in the left ear, for both air conduction and bone conduction. And now I've gotten speech thresholds using common spondee words. Spondees are just two syllable words with equal emphasis on both syllables. It's a closed set. It's a list of words that I gave them ahead of time. And I'm just going to make this up. But the SRT, the speech reception threshold, should more or less match what we get kind of right here with the pure tones. So it would be likely this SRT would be around 15. This SRT, because they have poor hearing in the high frequencies, would likely be around 30 or so, but that's just a guess. From there, in the right ear, we are now going to do one other speech test where I add about 40 decibels to whatever the person's SRT was, speech reception threshold, and speak to them at a nice audible level. In other words, this patient should have no trouble hearing the sound, okay? I then go to a different word list. This time, it's a open set. It could be any old word in the entire language of question. They are single syllable words and they are phonemically balanced, meaning this list, each of these lists of 25 words has more or less representative uh, phonemic kind of frequency within the language in question. Like there's no one, one phonemic sound that's overly sampled. I present that list of words to patient, 25 words, and they get 4% right for each one that they get right. Each one that they get wrong, you can subtract 4% if that's easier to think of. But because it's a 25-word list and we're dealing 4% for each correct or each wrong word, I'm going to get a score here. This person likely would get 100%. They'd get all 25 words right. But this person here may miss a few because of this high-frequency hearing loss. Remember, a high-frequency hearing loss is going to give us a little bit of trouble hearing sounds like ss and f and f. So somebody with this hearing configuration, they may miss... The word twins, where is it? Right there. Twins, they may only hear twin. And if they say twin, that is an error because the word is twins. Now, I have to be careful with how I say it, um, but you get the idea. Anytime a person gets a word wrong, even if it's just by one phoneme, that's an error. Let's just make up a percentage here and say that this person got 92%. But that's still an excellent word recognition score, okay? After we've gotten all of that information,